Chapter Eight, Part Three of the Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of H.M.S. Bounty, Its Cause and Consequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett Downey. The Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of H.M.S. Bounty by Sir John Barrow. Chapter Eight. Part three. The women are clothed in white cloth made from the paper mulberry, the dress extending from the shoulders to the feet, in double folds, and so loose as entirely to conceal the shape of the person. The mothers, while nursing, carry the infant within their dress. As the child advances in growth, it sits across the hip of the parent, with its little hands clinging to the shoulder, while the mother's arm passing round it keeps it in safety. The men and boys, except on Sunday, when they appear in English dresses, generally wear only the mara, or waistcloth, which, passing over the hips and between the legs, is knotted behind. The climate is in fact too hot for cumbersome clothing. The women, when working, use only a petticoat with a jacket. The men are stated to be from five feet eight inches to six feet high, of great muscular strength and excellent figures. We did not see, says Captain Walgrave, one cripple or defective person, except one boy, whom, in the most good-humoured way, and laughing heartily, they brought to me, observing, You ought to be brothers, you have each lost the right eye. I acknowledge the connection, and no doubt for the future he will be called the Captain. Captain Beechey has given a more detailed account of the physical qualities of the Pitcairn Islanders. He says they are tall, robust, and healthy. Their average height, five feet, ten inches. The tallest man measured six feet and one quarter of an inch. And the shortest of the adults, five feet, nine inches and one eighth. Their limbs well proportioned, round and straight. Their feet turning a little inwards. A boy of eight years measured four feet and one inch. Another of nine years, four feet, three inches. Their simple food and early habits of exercise give them a muscular power and activity not often surpassed it is recorded on the island that george young and edward quintal have each carried at one time a kedge anchor two sledgehammers and an armorer's anvil weighing together upwards of six hundred pounds and that quintal once carried a boat twenty-eight feet in length in the water they are almost as much at home as on land and can remain almost a whole day in the sea they frequently swim round their little island the circuit of which is at the least seven miles, and the women are nearly as expert swimmers as the men. The female descendants of the Otaheite women are almost as muscular as the males, and taller than the generality of the sex. Polly Young, who was not the tallest on the island, measured five feet nine inches and a half. The features of both men and women are regular and well formed, eyes bright and generally hazel, though in a few instances blue the eyebrows thin and rarely meeting, the nose a little flattened, and being rather extended at the nostrils, partakes of the Otaheitan character, as do the lips, which are broad and strongly sulcated, their ears moderately large, and the lobes are invariably united with the cheek. They are generally perforated, when young, for the reception of flowers, a very common custom among the natives of the South Sea Islands, hair black, sometimes curling, sometimes straight, teeth regular and white, on the whole, they are well-looking people. Captain Beechey says, The women have all learned the art of midwifery. The parturition generally takes place during the night-time, that the duration of labor is seldom longer than five hours, and it has not yet in any case proved fatal. But there is no instance of twins, nor of a single miscarriage, except from accident. Infants are generally bathed three times a day in cold water, and are sometimes not weaned for three or four years. But when that does take place, they are fed upon popo, made of ripe plantains and boiled taro root, rubbed into a paste. Mr. Colley, the surgeon of the Blossom, remarks that nothing is more extraordinary in the history of the island than the uniform good health of the children. The teething is easily got over, they have no bowel complaints, and are exempt from those contagious diseases which affect children in large communities. He offered to vaccinate the children as well as all the grown persons but they deemed the risk of infection of smallpox to be too small to render that operation necessary. 
as proof how very much simple diet and constant exercise tend to the healthful state of the body the skin of these people though in such robust health compared with that of the europeans always felt cold and their pulses always considerably lower the doctor examined several of them in the forenoon he found george young's only sixty three others in the afternoon after dinner were sixty eight seventy two and seventy six while those of the officers who stood the heat of the climate best were above eighty it is impossible not to feel a deep interest in the welfare of this little society and at the same time an apprehension that something may happen to disturb that harmony and destroy that simplicity of manners which have hitherto characterized it it is to be feared indeed that the seeds of discord are already sown it appears from captain waldgrave's statement that no less than three englishmen have found their way into this happy society one of them john buffett mentioned by beechey is a harmless man and as it has been stated of great use to the islanders in his capacity of clergyman and schoolmaster he is also a clever and useful mechanic as a shipwright and joiner and is much beloved by the community two others have since been left on the island one of them by name john evans son of a coachmaker in the employ of long of st martin's lane who has married a daughter of john adams through whom he possesses and cultivates a certain portion of land the third is george hun nobbs who calls himself pastor registrar and schoolmaster thus infringing on the privileges of john buffett and being a person of superior talents and of exceeding great impudence he has deprived buffett of a great number of his scholars and hence a sufficient cause exists of division and dissension among the members of the little society which were never known before buffett and evans support themselves by their industry but this nobs not only claims exemption from labor as being their pastor but also as being entitled to a maintenance at the expense of the community he has married a daughter of charles and granddaughter to the late fletcher christian whose descendants as captain of the gang might be induced to claim superiority and which probably might be allowed by general consent had they but possessed a moderate share of talent but it is stated that thursday october and charles christian the sons of the chief mutineer are ignorant uneducated men the only chance for the continuance of peace is the general dislike in which this nobs is held and the gradual intellectual improvement of the rising generation footnote forty it seems that adams on his deathbed called all the heads of families together and urged them to appoint a chief this however they have not done which makes it the more to be apprehended that nobs by his superior talent or cunning will force himself upon them into that situation captain waldgrave thinks however that edward quintal who possesses the best understanding of any on the island will in time arrive at that honor his only book is the bible but it is quite astonishing he observes what a fund of knowledge he has derived from it his wife too is stated to be a woman of excellent understanding and their eldest boy william has been so carefully educated that he excels greatly all the others the descendants of young are also said to be persons generally of promising abilities how the patriarch adams contrived to instill into the minds of these people the true principles of religion and morality is quite surprising he was able to read but only learned to write in his latter days and having accomplished this point he made a scheme of laws by which he succeeded to govern his little community in the way we have seen the celebration of marriage and baptism were strictly observed according to the rites of the church of england but he never ventured on confirmation in the sacrament of the lord's supper he taught the children the church catechism the ten commandments the lord's prayer and the creed and he satisfied himself that in these were comprised all of the christian duties by the instrumentality of these precepts drawn from the book of common prayer and the bible footnote forty one he was enabled after the slaughter of all his associates to rear up all the children in the principles and precepts of christianity in purity of morals and in a simplicity of manners that have surprised and delighted every stranger that has visited the island captain walgrave says they are so strongly attached to those beautiful prayers that are found in the liturgy of the church of england that there is no danger of a dissenting minister being received among them it is to be hoped this may be the case but it may be asked will they escape from the snares of george hun nobs it would seem indeed that this man has already thrust upon them what he calls a code of laws in which he enumerates crimes such as murder and adultery 
unknown and unheard of among these simple people since the time that adams was sole legislator and patriarch punishment of adultery to give a specimen of nobs legislation is whipping for the first offence to both parties and marriage within three months for the second if the parties refuse to marry the penalties are forfeiture of lands property and banishment from the island offenders are to be tried before three elders who pronounce sentence it is quite clear this silly person does not understand what is meant by adultery as to the tenure of land it is fortunately provided for previous to his arrival on the island the whole island it seems was partitioned out by adams among the families of the original settlers so that a foreigner cannot obtain any except by purchase or marriage captain waldgrave reckons that eleven twelfths are uncultivated and that population is increasing so rapidly that in the course of a century the island will be fully peopled and that the limit may be taken at one thousand souls the rate at which population is likely to increase may perhaps be determined by political economists from the following data in seventeen ninety the island was first settled by fifteen men and twelve women making a total of twenty seven of these were remaining in eighteen hundred one man and five women with nineteen children the eldest nine years of age making in the whole twenty five in 1808 mr folger makes the population amount to 35 being an increase of 10 in eight years in 1814 six years afterwards sir thomas dane states the adult population at 40 which must be a mistake as 14 years before 19 of the 25 then existing were children in 1825 captain beechey states the whole population at 66 of whom 36 were males and 30 females and in 1830 captain waldgrave makes it amount to 79 being an increase of 13 in five years or 20 per cent which is a less rapid increase than might be expected but there can be little doubt it will go on with an accelerated ratio provided the means of subsistence should not fail them captain waldgrave's assumption that this island is sufficiently large for the maintenance of one thousand souls is grounded on incorrect data it does not follow that because one twelfth of the island will maintain eighty persons the whole must support nine hundred and sixty persons the island is not more than four square miles or two thousand five hundred and sixty acres and as a ridge of rocky hills runs from north to south having two peaks exceeding one thousand feet in height it is more than probable that not one half of it is capable of cultivation it would seem indeed from several ancient morays being discovered among these hills some stone axes or hatchets of compact basaltic lava very hard and capable of a fine polish four stone images about six feet high placed on a platform not unlike those on easter island one of which has been preserved and is the rude representation of the human figure to the hips hewn out of a piece of red lava these remains would seem to indicate a former population that had found it expedient to abandon the island from its insufficiency to support it captain beechey observes that from these images and the large piles of stones on heights to which they must have been dragged with great labor it may be concluded that the island was inhabited for a considerable time and from bones being found always buried under these piles and never upon the surface we may presume that those who survived quitted the island in their canoes to seek an asylum elsewhere it appears from beechey that adams had contemplated the prospect of an increasing population with a limited means of supporting it and requested that he would communicate with the british government upon the subject which he says he did and that through the interference of the admiralty and colonial office means have been taken for removing them to any place they may choose for themselves it is to be hoped however that no such interference will take place for half a century at least there is no danger of any want of food the attempt however was made through the means of a mr nott a missionary of otaheite who being on a visit to this country was authorized on his return to make arrangements for their removal to otaheite if they wished it and if pomar the king of the island should not object to receive them and he carried a letter to this chief from lord bathurst acquainting him with the intention of the british government and expressing the hope that he would be induced to receive under his protection a people whose moral and religious character had created so lively an interest in their favour but it fortunately happened that this missionary passed the island without stopping and mr joshua hill subsequently proposed their removal to new south wales but his vessel was considered too small for the purpose two years after this as difficulties had occurred to prevent the above-mentioned intentions from being carried into effect 
sir george murray deemed it desirable that no time should be lost in affording such assistance to these islanders as might at all events render their present abode as comfortable as circumstances would allow until arrangements could be made for their future disposal either in one of the society islands as originally proposed or at one of our settlements on new holland the assistance here alluded to has been afforded as above mentioned by his majesty's ship seringa patam it is sincerely to be hoped that such removal will be no longer thought of no complaint was made no apprehension of want expressed to captain waldgrave who left them contented and happy and captain beechey since his return has received a letter from john buffett who informs him of a notification made by not the missionary at otaheite that the king was willing to receive them and that measures would be taken for their removal but he adds the people are so much attached to and satisfied with their native island as not to have a wish to leave it the breaking up of this happy innocent and simple-minded little society by some summary process and consigning them to those sinks of infamy on new holland or van diemen's land or to mix them up with the dram drinkers the psalm singers and the languid and lazy otahitians would in either case be a subject of deep regret to all who take an interest in their welfare and to themselves would be the inevitable loss of all those amiable qualities which have obtained for them the kind and generous sympathy of their countrymen at home we have a person who acts as consul at otaheite and it is to be hoped that he will receive instructions on no account to sanction but on the contrary to interdict any measure that may be attempted on the part of the missionaries for their removal perhaps however as money would be required for such a purpose they may be considered safe from that quarter the time must come when they will emigrate on their own accord when the hive is full they will send out their swarms captain beechey tells us that the reading of some books of voyages and travels belonging to bligh and left in the bounty had created a desire in some of them to leave it but that family ties and an ardent affection for each other and for their native soil had always interposed on the few occasions that offered to prevent individuals going away singly george adams however who had failed when the blossom was there to soften the heart of polly young and had no wife to detain him was very anxious to embark in that ship that he might see something of the world beyond the narrow limits of his own little island and beechey would have taken him had not his mother wept bitterly at the idea of parting from him and wished to impose terms touching his return to the island that could not be acceded to pitcairn island lies at the southeastern extremity of a chain of islands which including the society and friendly islands exceed a hundred in number many of them wholly uninhabited and the rest but thinly peopled all speaking the same or nearly the same language which is also spoken by the natives of pitcairn island and all of the two groups are richly clothed with the spontaneous products of nature fit for the use of man to all these they will have when necessity prompts them easy means of access no large vessels are required for an immigration of this kind the frailest barks and single canoes have been driven hundreds of miles over the pacific the pitcarners have already proceeded from the simple canoe to rowboats and the progress from this to small decked vessels is simple and natural they may thus at some future period which is not at all improbable be the means of spreading christianity and consequently civilization throughout the numerous groups of islands in the southern pacific whereas to remove them as has been imprudently suggested would be to devote them at once to misery and destruction that there is no deficiency in the number and variety of plants producing food and clothing for the use of man will appear from the following list which is far from being complete indigenous cocos nucifera coconut musa paradisica plantains musa sapietum bananas dioscoria sativum yams convolvulus batatas sweet potatoes arum escalantum taro root arum costatum yapa basantia papyrifera cloth tree dracania terminalis tea plant Alaritis chaloba, dudo, Morinda centrifolia, nono, Tonina, a large timber tree, Ficus indica, banyan tree, Morus chinesis, mulberry, Pandanus odoratissimus, and a great number of other indigenous plants, some of which are useful and others ornamental. Introduced. Artocarpus incisa, breadfruit. 
cucurpita citrullus watermelons concurpita pepo pumpkins solanum escalonum potatoes nicotiana tabacum tobacco citrus linoleum lemon citrus arantium orange besides these they have european peas beans and onions sugar canes ginger pepper and turmeric in fact situated as the island is in a temperate climate just without the tropic and enjoying abundance of rain there is scarcely any vegetable with the exception of a few of the equinoxial plants that may not be cultivated here the z maize or indian corn would be infinitely useful both for themselves their poultry and their pigs as a great part of the island is at present covered with trees which would necessarily give way to an extended cultivation and as trees attract rain captain waldgrave seems to think that when these are removed showers will be less frequent but there is little fear of this being the case the central ridge with points that exceed eleven hundred feet in height will more effectually attract and condense the clouds than any quantity of trees growing at a less elevation and there can be little doubt that plenty of water will be found by digging at the foot of the hills or close to the sea coast the climate appears to be unexceptionable during the sixteen days of december the height of summer that the blossom remained there the range of the thermometer on the island from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon was from seventy six degrees to eighty degrees on board ship from seventy four degrees to seventy six degrees from whence captain beechey places the mean temperature during that time at seventy six and a half degrees in winter he says the southwesterly winds blow very cold and even snow has been known to fall not one visitor to this happy island has taken leave of its amiable inhabitants without a feeling of regret captain beechey says when we are about to take leave our friends assembled to express their regret at our departure all brought some little present for our acceptance which they wished us to keep in remembrance of them after which they accompanied us to the beach where we took our leave of the female part of the inhabitants adams and the young men pushed off in their own boat to the ship determined to accompany us to sea as far as they could with safety they continued on board unwilling to leave us until we were a considerable distance from land when they shook each of us feelingly by the hand and amidst expressions of the deepest concern at our departure wished us a prosperous voyage and hoped that we might one day meet again as soon as they were clear of the ship they all stood up in their boat and gave us three hearty cheers which were as heartily returned as the weather became foggy the barge towed them towards the shore and we took a final leave of them unconscious until the moment of separation of the warm interest their situation and good conduct had created in us happy thrice happy people may no improper intruders thrust themselves into your peaceful and contented society may the providence which has hitherto protected you still continue to pour down those blessings upon you of which you appear to be so truly sensible and for which you are justly thankful may it throw round the shores of your enviable little eden cherubim and a flaming sword to guard its approaches from those who would endanger your peace and above all shield you from those who would perplex and confuse your unsophisticated minds by mysterious doctrines which they do not themselves comprehend remain steadfast to the faith which your late father and benefactor has instilled into your minds called from the precepts of your bible and be content for the present to observe those simple rules for your religious and moral conduct which he has taught you and which he drew pure and undefiled from that sacred source and be assured that so long as you shall adhere to the line of conduct you have hitherto pursued and be contented with your present lot your happiness is secure but once admit ignorant or false teachers among you and from that period you may date the commencement of misfortunes and misery end of chapter eight part three recording by brett downing of the eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of h m s bounty its cause and consequences this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Denny Sayers. The Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of H.M.S. Bounty by Sir John Barrow. Conclusion.
many useful and salutary lessons of conduct may be drawn from this eventful history, more especially by officers of the navy, both old and young, as well as by those subordinate to them. In the first place, it most strongly points out the dreadful consequences that are almost certain to ensue from a state of insubordination and mutiny on board a ship of war, and the equally certain fate that, at one time or other, awaits all those who have the misfortune to be concerned in a transaction of this revolting nature. In the present instance, the dreadful retribution which overtook them, and which was evinced in a most extraordinary manner, affords an awful and instructive lesson to seamen, by which they may learn that although the guilty may be secured for a time in evading the punishment due to the offended laws of society, yet they must not hope to escape the pursuit of divine vengeance. It will be recollected that the number of persons who remained in the bounty after her piratical seizure, and of course charged with the crime of mutiny, was twenty-five that these subsequently separated into two parties, sixteen having landed at Otaheite, and afterwards taken from thence in the Pandora as prisoners, and nine having gone with the bounty to Pitcairn's island. Of the sixteen taken in the Pandora, one, Mr. Peter Haywood, midshipman, sentenced to death, but pardoned. Two, James Morbison, boatswain's mate, sentenced to death but pardoned. Three, William Muspratt, commander's steward, sentenced to death but pardoned. Four, Thomas Burkett, seaman, condemned and executed. Five, John Millward, seaman, condemned and executed. Six, Thomas Ellison, Seaman, condemned and executed. 7. Joseph Coleman, armorer, condemned and executed. 8. Charles Norman, carpenter's mate, tried and acquitted. 9. Thomas Mackintosh, carpenter's crew, tried and acquitted. 10. Michael Byrne, seaman, tried and acquitted. 11. Mr. George Stewart, midshipman, drowned in irons when the Pandora was wrecked. 12. John Sumner, seaman, drowned in irons. 13. Richard Skinner, seaman, drowned in irons. 14. Henry Hilbrandt, Cooper, drowned in irons. 15. Charles Churchill, Master-at-Arms, murdered by Matthew Thompson. 16. Matthew Thompson, seaman, murdered by Churchill's friends in Otaheite. Of the nine who landed in Pitcairn's Island, 1. Mr. Fletcher Christian, acting lieutenant, murdered by the Otaheitans. 2. John Williams, seaman, murdered by the Otaheitans. 3. Isaac Martin, seaman, murdered by the Otaheitans. 4. John Mills, gunner's mate, murdered by the Otaheitans. 5. William Brown, botanist's assistant, murdered by the Otaheitans. 6. Matthew Quintal, seaman, put to death by Young and Adams in self-defense. 7. William McCroy, seaman, became insane and killed by throwing himself from a rock. 8. Mr. Edward Young, midshipman, died of asthma. 9. Alex Smith, alias John Adams, seaman, died in 1829. Young officers of the Navy, as well as the common seamen, may also derive some useful lessons from the events of this history. 
they will see the melancholy results of affording the least encouragement for seamen to depart from their strict line of duty, and to relax in that obedience to the orders of superiors, by which alone the discipline of the service can be preserved. They will learn how dangerous it is to show themselves careless and indifferent in executing those orders, by thus setting a bad example to the men. It ought also to enforce on their minds how necessary it is to avoid even the appearance of acting in any way that can be considered as repugnant to, or subversive of, the rules and regulations of the service, and most particularly to guard against any conduct that may have the appearance of lowering the authority of their superiors, either by their words or actions. No doubt can remain on the minds of unprejudiced persons, or such as are capable of weighing evidence, that the two young midshipmen, Stuart and Haywood, were perfectly innocent of any share in the transaction in question, and yet, because they happened to be left in the ship, not only contrary to their wish and intention, but kept down below by force, the one lost his life by being drowned in chains, and the other was condemned to die, and only escaped from suffering the last penalty of the law by a recommendation to the royal mercy. The only point in which these two officers failed was that they did not at once demand permission to accompany their commander while they were allowed to remain on deck and had the opportunity of doing so. The manly conduct of young Haywood throughout his long and unmerited sufferings affords an example of firmness, fortitude, and resignation to the divine will that is above all praise. In fact, nothing short of conscious innocence could have supported him in the severe trials he had to undergo. The melancholy effects which tyrannical conduct, harsh and opprobrious language, ungovernable passion, and a worrying and harassing temper on the part of naval commanders, seldom fail to produce on the minds of those who are subject to their capricious and arbitrary command, are strongly exemplified in the cause and consequences of the mutiny in the bounty as described in the course of this history. Conduct of this kind, by making the inferior officers of a ship discontented and unhappy, has the dangerous tendency, as in the case of Christian, to incite the crew to partake in their discontent, and be ready to assist in any plan to get rid of the tyrant. We may see in it, also, how very little credit a commander is likely to gain, either with the service or the public at large, when the duties of a ship are carried on, as they would appear to have been in the Pandora, in a cold, phlegmatic, and unfeeling manner, and with an indifference to the comfort of all around him, subjecting offenders of whatever description to unnecessary restraint, and a severity of punishment which, though strictly within the letter of the law, contributes in no way to the ends of discipline or of justice. The conduct of Bly however mistaken he may have been in his mode of carrying on the duties of the ship, was most exemplary throughout the long and perilous voyage he performed in an open boat on the wide ocean, with the most scanty supply of provisions and water, and in the worst weather. The result of such meritorious conduct holds out every encouragement to both officers and men, by showing them that, by firmness and perseverance, and the adoption of well-digested measures, steadily pursued in spite of opposition, the most hopeless undertaking, to all appearance, may be successfully accomplished. And lastly, 
the fate that has attended almost every one of those concerned in the mutiny and piracy of his majesty's ship bounty ought to operate as a warning to and make a deep impression on the minds of our brave seamen not to suffer themselves to be led astray from the straightforward line of their duty either by order or persuasion of some hot-brained thoughtless or designing person whether their superior or equal, but to remain faithful under all circumstances to their commanding officer as any mutinous proceedings or disobedience of his orders are sure to be visited upon them in the long run, either by loss of life or by a forfeiture of that liberal provision which the British government has bestowed on its seamen for long and faithful services." P. S. Just as this last sheet came from the press, the editor has noticed, with a feeling of deep and sincere regret, a paragraph in the newspapers, said to be extracted from an American paper, stating that a vessel sent to Pitcairn's Island by the missionaries of Otaheite has carried off the whole of the settlers to the latter island. If this be true, and the mention of the name of not gives a colour to the transaction the cherubim must have slept the flaming sword have been sheathed and another eden has been lost and what is worse than all that native simplicity of manners that purity of morals and that singleness of heart which so peculiarly distinguish this little interesting society are all lost they will now be dispersed among the missionary stations as humble dependents where kitty quintal and the rest of them may get food for their souls such as it is in exchange for the substantial blessings they enjoyed on pitcairn's island end of the conclusion Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox.